Welcome to the podcast for de-radicalization and rehabilitation. Today we have Elvar Jonsson from the Sweden, Swedish Prison Probation Service with us. Uh, warm welcome, Elvar. Uh, firstly, introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit how you became involved in the work of rehabilitation and de-radicalization. Yes, uh, my name is Elvar Jonsson. I work in the Swedish uh, Prison and Probation Service. I've been uh, Treating clients that are, are involved with uh, organized crimes since year 2013, and we've been using the treatment program NT. And uh, it is the same treatment program we try to uh, treat violent extremist offenders with. And in the beginning, our goal was to see if we could reach these type of clients with the treatment program. And based on my experience for doing this for almost two years, uh, we can reach them. Uh-huh. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, target group uh, and, and other components of the program? There are two target groups, uh, or now three, violent extremist offenders. But in the beginning, it was uh, for clients that wanted to leave organized crimes, or clients that have high risk for uh, uh, getting into a fight. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. For violent crimes. crimes. Violent crimes, thank you. I was trying to find the word. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, what are the elements and components of, of the program? We have six themes in the program. The first one is identity and sense, sense of self, mm-hmm. aggression and violence, alcohol and narcotics, social situ- situation, re- uh, relationship and associates, and attitudes and values. And in the beginning, we have three phases. In the beginning, the first phase, we do this kind of uh, case formulation where we ask a lot of questions. And uh, it depends on the answer. We know which themes we want to work with in uh, the program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you, you started it from, from an individualized assessment of, of the client and, yeah. and his or her needs, and you, you build it from there. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And taking your personal perspective, uh, uh, Edward, based on your experience, uh, what is the state of art in uh, in de-radicalization and disengagement uh, work? For me, it's not that black and white, actually. Uh, in the beginning, our approach was to use disengagement to try to change the client's uh, thoughts about his or her criminal behavior. But what we saw during the treatment was that while I was working with this engagement, I was also working with de-radicalization of somehow. I asked one of my clients, example, uh, your greatest uh, dream in life is to be, uh, become a martyr and kill as many inf- infidels as possible. And that would be your ticket to the paradise of, uh, in the next life, in the afterlife. And uh, he said uh, yes, and he wanted to marry 72 versions, I think, sit at the table with Mohammed, and like, he was like always thinking about the afterlife. And then I started asking questions like, uh, okay, okay, I understand, but uh, if one of those infidels you kill is a devoted Muslim, are you still allowed to get into the paradise? And his answer was no. He looked down, and I can just feel that he has never thought about that question and then later in the program he was like uh, oh challenging uh, it was a difficult uh, re- rehabilitation for him and he was questioning this what is martyrdom and what is uh, simply killing innocent people so what we saw uh, during the treatment that we was we were working with this engagement we were changing his thoughts about the violent crimes and stuff uh, behavior, but we were also changing his, um, how do you say it, uh, ideology, the religion, everything he was being taught through the radicalization. Mm. So for me, it's like mm. it's difficult to work with this engagement if you're not also working with de radicalization. Yes, yeah, that, that's a very good observation, I have to say. And uh, more and more researchers are also of the opinion that. Uh, uh, if you really want this process to be uh, more sustainable, 
in terms of you know keeping people away from from radicalized networks it's uh, it's also important to, to work on the de-radicalization not only on the disengagement uh, and as you as you describe the process it's so complex that you cannot really work on one without touching on the other exactly so that, that was a very good example thank you very much uh, uh elvar um and uh, so from this, this uh, from the same personal kind of professional experience and perspectives, what, what are the main learning points that we can use in practice? Um, in other words, what should practitioners know to uh, be in line with, with, um, with uh, the most uh, uh, up-to-date pra practices of rehabilitation and radicalization? Yeah. Uh, my main learning point actually was uh, that uh, this radical radical uh, clients wasn't that different from uh, other clients I had that are involved in organized crime, especially clients that are involved with like motorcycle gangs, uh, hells angels, bandidos, and so on, because both clients client groups are like it's we against the world. And you're not allowed to say against the rules or allowed to say against the Quran when they were. Some of my clients, that when they got radicalized, they told me that uh, during the radicalized uh, process, they were shown by the group a lot of uh, phrases from the Quran. Mm. When they realized afterwards, these phrases wasn't like directly taken from the Quran. They were puzzled together mm. to put uh, the text out. Uh, the message out they wanted to preach mm. and my clients uh, was suspicious all of them and had like questions but uh, they weren't allowed to question it mm. and while they were doing, having these questions they tried to filter them out or block the questions out the suspicions and while doing that they use a lot of counter arguments like what they're telling me is true, what they're telling me is true. So what I learned through this process also, and uh, not only the similarity between the two groups, it's uh, you should never have an argument with them because you're going to lose. Because they already had all those arguments with themselves during the radicalization. You can definitely problematize and like discuss it from a different, uh, different perspective. And so, but never try to arguing that they're wrong and you're right because you will just hit the wall. And that's a very good and important point. That, and, and we know this from practice that most people don't really change by being argued with, but it's it's uh, it's other elements of the process that really leads to change and, and leads to reflection, and especially. And very good examples you you mentioned of, of kind of self censoring and self um, uh, kind of you, you you put yourself in, in a specific mindset where you don't allow a dialogue. Uh, on this, is there any specific method or or way that you work with this that you can share with us? That's a big question. Um, it's. In the beginning, my clients didn't, we ha didn't have any trust. They didn't believe I was there to uh, treat them. They were afraid I was from uh, the police trying to gain information about, I about ISIS or Al-Qaeda or NMR. Uh, so they didn't trust me at all. And in, one, in the first session with one of my clients, he was sitting there with a the beard, and he said, people think I'm involved with Al-Qaeda. And I actually didn't know that. I just knew what he was convicted for. And I was, I, I, my answer to that was, okay, how does it make you feel that you, uh, that people think that you're affiliated with Al-Qaeda? So my approach is always to turn everything they say into how it affects them. Mm. Uh, and I never spoke about Al-Qaeda again with that guy. He mentioned it two or three times, but then Al-Qaeda was irre irre irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Because for me, the interesting, interesting thing is why, the way in, and he hypothesis for the way out. So everything to get this uh, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic alliance, 
I always turn everything into them. Uh, how how was your upbringing? How was your relationship with your parents? How did, does it feel for you to sit in a Swedish prison? Tell me. Uh, you're sitting here. Uh, I'm sitting here. Uh, what happened? Why are you convicted, Fallon? And me, as I'm working as a therapist. Tell me your story. Why are you sitting there? You're an intelligent man. And stuff. So, my secret uh, is to turn everything into how it affected them. So very, very client-centered and, and also really focused on building trust. And, and yeah, really it's very important. Key. Without trust, there's no rehabilitation. Yeah, no, the trust and alliance is usually, usually central when it comes to this type of work in these, these target groups. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one question here, would there be any specific uh, uh, conversation techniques or, or, or methods that you uh, use in, during these sessions? We're all educated in motivational interviewing, but we only use that technique when we feel that the client isn't there. The motivation for the client is like leaving, uh, or it's like motivation is dynamic. So let me bring out uh, the motivational interviewing techniques. But otherwise, it's being like curious, uh, being warm. Tell, tell the client something about yourself. You have to be a person for the client, not only I work in the Swedish prison and provide service. It's like um, having a dialogue. Mm -hmm. You have to be in the same, um, yeah, at the same level. Mm -hmm. And I always uh, tell my clients they have a lot to teach me as well. I have maybe something to teach them. They can help me to be a better uh, therapist. But one of my clients, that in the beginning, he was definitely uh, still radicalized. And his biggest dream was to uh, make a suicide bomb and kill him and inf a lot of infidels. But during the treatment, uh, I was seeing that he had, he had lost his balance in his uh, ideology. I asked him, OK, if a cousin of yours was, was uh, asking you advice, he wants to move to Syria, what would you tell him? Or what would you, would you like me to tell him? And then suddenly the client was the therapist talking to himself. Yeah, there's a lot of techniques like that. Yes. As a leader expert in this uh, field, uh, Elvar, how do you see the advance uh, in uh, the radicalization and disengagement, let's say for the next five to ten years? That's also a big question. I know for us here in Sweden, we have to um, combine our psychological treatment with some kind of another expertise around the client. I think the client's needs uh, and team as a, as a treatment program, the psychological program, but they need also some, someone that is an expert or uh, expert in the in the ideology or something that it can help the clients to um, see that violence isn't the answer. I also think that uh, we need to work with other authorities or aid organizations because from my point of view, these clients have little or no social ties to society. And if we want them to come back to society, they need some help. They want... Uh, social context, housing, work, just like me and you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the treatment program alone doesn't help with that. But I think combined, we can come a long way. Wow. Well, it's still a long way to go. Uh, as, as, yeah. as, uh, but uh, I think uh, we learned a lot today from, uh, from you and I think our uh, fellow practitioners also got a lot of advice from you in terms of you know how to build up trust how to build up reports how to um to use all sorts of con uh, conversation uh, uh, techniques to to help uh, clients understand their position and find new ways to come out of uh, the radicalized networks uh thank you very much Elmar. was a was a real pleasure and uh, we hope to, to stay in touch and learn from you in the future thank you thank you